So if there we go. Okay. If we if we know we have to miss a class, um, and we want to participate in the in the in your Tuesday class, is it good enough to let you know on a Monday? Yes, if you let me know, that's that's great. Okay. Um, Brian, I forgot yesterday I was busy and I was trying to remember what is the deadline for putting in the homework? Oh, um, well, because of the time difference, yeah. um, I'm up two hours earlier than you guys. I, I do need it the day before and earlier in the day is better yeah. because um, I, after supper, I'm usually... Uh, involved in other things or or uh, wiped out <laughs> okay so the day before and early as possible yeah for yeah, sure yeah okay yeah, thanks <laughs> yeah i couldn't remember when um yeah yeah it just gets awkward in the mornings like yesterday morning i had an awful time where my computer went off in the night i've got this imac that is always giving me problems so i i turn it on and it, this silly thing will take three or four hours to get up to where it can function Oh. And, and I couldn't pull some of the people's, some of the late um, submissions. I couldn't pull them off the computer and get them into my PowerPoint because my computer just wouldn't let me do it. So that's unbelievable because uh, I thought of getting a Mac because I didn't think Macs did that. I have Windows problems and I was away at my daughter's place in Midland and I could not open. I thought my computer was broken. And Windows was like going on and updating everything. And then when it got updated, the battery died. So I couldn't keep in touch with people. I was like, I would, I mean, Windows is on my computer more than I am. Yeah. It's like they own my computer, not me. I, I, I can't believe how much they're intrusive. Yeah. Yeah. I had, uh, I've just, I don't know why, but this particular iMac has caused all kinds of problems. I've had, People look at it and they can't figure out why it does what it does, but huh. yeah, unfortunately. Well, is it three hour difference or four hours? Two hours. Two, oh, two hours. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> what would you like the cutoff time to be to send them in on Tuesday? Um, just it, earlier in the day is better. You know, whenever you can get it in, be great. Okay. Again, if you send it in at nine, that's 11 o'clock for me, you know, sort of thing. So, but in, I'm sorry that yesterday I sent in mine late, but it was the only time because last week here we lost power because yeah. of the, um, the after was uh, Easter. So it was just yesterday they could paint it. Yeah, I'm aware that uh, the power problem uh, <laughs> has real concerns for you guys. <laughs> so yeah, you know, whenever you can, get it in. All right. Hope everybody had a wonderful Easter weekend. Awesome. Had some fun experiences with that. Now, mm -hmm. since we're doing fish, I thought you'd appreciate this. This is a rare photo of a shark stepping on a Lego. <laughs> 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 Any of you who stepped on kids' Legos can appreciate the look of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this too, and this is just it was just so fun. My friend uh, had a, my friend's cat lost an eye a while in a fight a while back. So give him a false one to give his confidence a little boost. <laughs> it's not, not that ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so here's so you, so you can kind of see the bigger picture of what I'm trying to do. Um, uh, starting last week and moving forward, <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to walk through the entire process of painting a painting from the very beginning all the way to the end, right when you put your signature on. And so <clears throat> last week we we talked a lot about um, the beginning point is your drawing, and it's the foundation. Bad drawing, bad painting, and um, um, it's just it's crucial that we just take that time. And I thought this would this is kind of a cool example I just found of somebody's pencil drawing. Beautiful, huh? Yeah, very very nicely done. But um, <clears throat> this week's critique, <laughs> as we focused last week on drawing. I'm going to try to focus more on the drawing part of what we're talking about rather than application of paint. And we'll talk more about that in a coming lesson. Any of you have a chance to play around with any of these little exercises I gave you last week? Yeah. You did? Was that a no or a yes? 
Not to me. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, again, I, I, rather than just for an interest's sake, I, I presented those as an idea that, that can really help us learn how to draw better. Uh, this idea again from last week, taking an object and drawing it from a different angle than what you're sitting at <clears throat> and trying to envision in your mind what it's gonna look like from a different angle. So anything like that you can do to increase your capacity to visualize and to, to draw. Very, very powerful, right? So once we've got the drawing in place and we, this drawing skill that we're very happy with, then comes the composition or how do I make a good drawing work, right? So <clears throat> composition is an interesting topic because it's actually hard to find a lot of stuff written on it. And uh, uh, so much of, of composition is intuitive, but uh, there are some rules. So I wanna walk you through a few of those rules. Uh, rule of thirds, what is that? Well, it's when you Always. divide your canvas up into three and uh, paint within the third. Okay. And, and, and how, do, how does it affect your painting? Uh, balance. There's balance. And, and what, what should you, how, do you, how do you use this in a painting? It makes it more interesting. And it's less predictable. Okay. Than if, you, if you put it in the middle, it's, uh, it, it loses an interest. It becomes boring. Okay, yes. If you drop your subject here, uh, boring, boring, boring. And for some reason, our eye connects with the idea that, you know, uh, things that line up on those lines just make sense. Like the little girl on that horizon line, everything doesn't have to line up, but if you are cognizant of those divisions, it makes a difference, right? So it's photographers use this all the time. It's their rule, really. They've, they've adapted it. So the rule of thirds in photography is a compositional guideline that evenly divides an image into thirds vertically and horizontally. Placing the subject or element of interest where the lines intersect creates a more powerful composition. <clears throat> so when we decide to lay out our, our piece, uh, this, is, this is useful to do that. How many of you consciously use the rule of thirds when you compose something? I do. Do you? I do too. <clears throat> right. Okay, good, good, good. It will make when I, when I, I'm not sure if this is part of it, but I find if you have odd amounts, odd numbers of, yes. of your images. Yeah, and that's rule number two, <laughs> the rule of odds. <laughs> the rule of odds suggests that an odd number of subjects in an image is more interesting than an even number. Thus, if you have more than one subject in your picture, the subject is to choose, the suggestion is to prove an arrangement with at least three subjects or five or seven or nine or whatever it works out to be. But it's really interesting. Um, I find that when I try to lay something out, if I drop four things in, it really doesn't look as good as if I just drop three in. There, there really is something um, magical about it, right? So, yeah. so be cognizant of, of threes. It doesn't have to be three of the identical object. You know, it might be a, a tree, a mountain, and a cloud. You know, but you're thinking in terms of three key focal things that tie together. Okay, so there's there's rule number two. Rule number three, the rule of space. <clears throat> so um, the idea of this is that um, uh, well, here's here's the Wikipedia thing. The rule of space applies to artwork picturing objects to which the artist wants to apply the illusion of movement or which is supposed to create a contextual bubble in the viewer's mind. So with the car, we've left space here so that it looks like it, it's not in the moving, but it's got a place to go, right? If you, had a, if you had a portrait of a person looking sideways, you would put them looking that direction with, with space where their eye is, is going. It would be really weird if you did a portrait and put the person over here looking off, off the edge that would feel completely imbalanced, right? And making us wonder what on earth is he looking at. So, um, so you can often leave white space in the direction of the where a person's looking, or where a runner is going, or or something of that nature. So, um, 
on last Friday, <clears throat> my wife and I went up to Banff and uh, we wandered into a couple galleries over there. One of them was a wildlife photographer and um, he had these gorgeous photographs, you know, that, and they're all, of course, blown up quite large. Um, buffalo, bear, uh, uh, coyotes, you know, wolves, all that kind of thing. But there was there were two paintings that absolutely floored me. And this was one of them. They were not painting, they were photographs. This is one of them. It's about six feet long and about three feet high. Wow. And for all these gorgeous photographs, this one absolutely leapt off the wall at me. And it wasn't the, the wolf that attracted me, it was this. I was so caught by the composition. And and it was it was stunning, you know. I mean, he could have he could have cut it off here. And it wouldn't have felt nearly as powerful as it did by leaving that giant space in there. It was beautiful. And then, then I turned around and looked the other way, and I saw this five foot square painting, or not, or not painting photograph, with wow. all of this white space. And here's a bear with a fish sitting in the water down in the corner. It was stunning. It was so fascinating how he used this composition. So as I'm marveling at this, the, the lady who ran the gallery said, uh, this particular photographer, that's what he's most well known for his compositions because he, he uses those rules and and uh, it it's breathtaking what he does. Fascinating, eh? Anyway, great examples of, of the rule of space. Fourth rule, <clears throat> simplify. And we've talked uh, frequently about this, but the idea is um, you you want your detail to be on the places you want the eye to go. And the, us, the other can be very, very um, su uh, suggestive, right? Like, you know, you can sort of tell there's mountains back in there, but you really don't know, right? And, uh, and yet when you, when you first look at it, it looks like a detailed painting simply because your eye's picking up the detail. So that's another very, very uh, good one. It's one that I, I don't know about you, but I struggle with with my eye getting caught on all the detail. Do you guys find that? And you find yourself wanting to throw everything in? <laughs> yes. <laughs> then it becomes muddy. <laughs> and it becomes muddy, yes. Muddy and overcrowded and your eye doesn't know what to look at. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a really a challenging rule to apply. And then this one, <clears throat> um, as I was looking this up the other day, I had never really considered this, or actually had him had even seen this particular artist's use of this, but using geometry. So related to the rule of odds is the observation that triangles are aesthetically pleasing uh, within an image. Now, for some reason, our eye is drawn to the idea of triangles. Paul Cezanne used the triangles in his compositions of still lifes, and a triangular form creates a sense of stability and strength. So Dean Mitchell is a very famous watercolor painter. Um, he paints a lot of, of uh, blacks and uh, they're absolutely stunning. They're so beautiful. But I had never really noticed his use of the triangle. And if you look at this whole thing, it's filled with triangles. You know, there's mm -hmm. triangles, triangles, um, triangles. And, and I, I looked at a lot of his images of old barns and homes and, and that kind of thing. And he uses this formula of uh, of triangles very powerfully, and like even here, you see how he's he's laid out that whole little scene, and he's consciously put it into a triangle. And uh, and again here, um, when you first look at this, you know, it says it's just a barn. If I painted a barn, it wouldn't look that cool. And the reason is because he has created the triangle thing by using the tree. And even that shadow, that's not thats not what that shadow really would look like. It's going to have more of a square end on it, not this pointy thing. But he's done that specifically to emphasize this principle of the, tri of the triangle. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> mm -hmm. And when you start studying his work, you see it everywhere that he uses it. Here again, he's used the concept of the triangle. And even in this portrait, he's, he's, con he's used the triangle. Beautiful, eh? Yeah. So there's just some some rules. Uh, 
that, um, that apply. Do you have any others that you use for composing? Nothing. I always go by the rule of odds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but other than the odds, um, I I think subconsciously you are aware of the space too, but not to the extent you just showed us. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I find um, that if I have like even if I'm doing an animal or a person, that if if they're looking left, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm much more comfortable if I flip them around and have them looking right. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it just feels more comfortable to me. That's I'm interesting. I'm the same. Like I feel exactly the same for some reason. Yeah. I've heard that's because we're from North America and you read from left yeah. to right. Yeah, I think well, that has to do with it. I just realized with my sketchbook, I don't like drawing on the left side of the page. Really? I'm always on the right side of the page. <laughs> and I, I became very aware of it because in one way, you know, there's no reason why you can't write on the back of the previous page or whatever, but I just don't like drawing on the left. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that at all. Yeah. I, I just draw it the way it appears. Yeah. It doesn't matter left or right to me. Yeah. Gabrielle, you'd probably have a real hard time driving in England. <laughs> yes. Yes, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> What's that crazy woman doing? <laughs> in those roundabouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, any other things that you do? When you sit down to compose a picture, like how do you start? I usually try to start from the bottom up. Okay. And, and not having been used to using a grid, I usually look at, um, give myself the reference as to um, how this, picture that I'm trying to compose um, meets around how, how much space there is around the subject. And I try to go from there. Okay, good. Why do you go from the bottom up? No idea. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Um, it depends. Sometimes, yeah, it, it usually ends up from the bottom up. <laughs> okay. All right, good. Anybody else have any tips? What, uh, you, I've shown you before how I will use my tracing paper and do my drawing on the tracing paper over top of my autocolor right. paper. Right. I find a lot of times that, that by doing that, I'll realize that I don't have the images in uh, where I want them on the page, you know, um, on the watercolor board. So I'll often take the tracing paper and move it. In, in different directions until, until I feel like it fits the watercolor frame better. Mm -hmm. The thing I mostly concentrate on with composition is with regard to my ref photo reference, mm -hmm. I decide which I am going to paint and what I'm going to omit. That's mostly yeah. what I do. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And that's in a really significant part of composing, right? Right. Actually, look at Dean, Dean Mitchell's painting right here. And with what you just said about what to include and what to omit, look how he has chosen to um, uh, have uh, disappearing lines in places. And even, and I'm not even sure what this is. I think this is uh, a dock that it's up against. But technically speaking, this should be deeply in shadow right there, right? Because it's up against that thing. But he's yeah, chosen. Yeah. To, leave, to put the light there and it balances. He's got a balance here, a balance there, right? So and where's his light source? Yeah, he's consciously chosen to do that in his composition. But where is the light source? Well, the light source is coming from above, but because this is against that, yeah. that thing, it should be dark. Should right? be. He has the shadow on the other side of the, of the boat, of yeah. the ship, yeah. 
And, and there's probably, because it looks like there's more room over here, there's probably light bouncing up here. So his photo reference is probably lighter on this side and darker on this side. But again, he's chosen to flip it because it balances better with mm -hmm. his piece. And you can see again, the balance, you can see these darks. He's got right. these three, three areas of darkness that tie it together. You know, if he hadn't hung this big round thing up here, it would feel a little imbalanced. Hmm. Interesting, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> Something I have found very helpful is Edgar Whitney's, his design elements. Yeah. Edgar, um, Edgar Whitney? Yes. Um, it, it would take too long to go through this, but if you just Google Ed, Edgar Whitney and his seven elements of design, he talks about unity, conflict, dominance, repetition, alter alternation balance harmony and gradation and and uh, and as well as the the seven principles as well and i find when i remember i try to attend to that and think about them uh, can you give us a little bit more information about some of them yeah certainly i mean i, I just googled it here um so he says for example conflict Conflict is the tension between opposing versions of the element, and it creates interest and excitement. For example, in color, conflict is created when you use two colors that are directly opposite on the color wheel. Mm -hmm. in, in value, the conflict is the setting the light against the dark. So in your most important part of your painting, you want the contrast to be the, the most in that sweet spot. Perfect. That kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. his all of I mean, there's tons of he's got eight different ones and they're excellent. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that very much. Hey, I'm glad Tanya brought that up. Um, the use of your of your uh, complementary colors is is a very important element in in what you do too. You know, oranges right. against blues and purples against yellows, that kind of thing, so that they uh, really pop. Right. What if it's not in your in your reference photo? Um, you don't have to reproduce the reference photo. No, you know, you're free to do whatever. And <clears throat> sometimes that's that's one of the great leaps forward in your artwork is when you can let go of the photo reference. And I always I always find it so. Um, some of the paintings that have these colors that you wouldn't normally see there, and yeah. I wonder how do they come about deciding that. Yeah. That's that's hard. Yeah. And sometimes if you really study something carefully, you will start to see an amazing amount of color that's happening in behind. So the subtle purples and subtle greens and blues and reds and the oranges, you know, they're they're the, often there. And it just takes looking. And our, and yet in our immediate look, we often think, well, it's gray. And we throw some gray in, you know. But look, look at Dean Mitchell's gray right there. Yeah. How many colors are actually in there? He's got teal, he's got purples, there's some blues, you know, and some uh, some raw siennas. And yet it just simply looks gray, <clears throat> right? And even in here, in his darks, look how much color he's got going on there. Some beautiful, warm and cool colors mixed into that. But also the windows, the way they go up in the middle, they sort of go on that triangular mm -hmm. shape as well. Yeah, 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 interesting. So yeah, um, those are all important compositional things. And the more you pre-think that kind of thing, the more powerful your painting is going to be when you get into it and start playing with it. Any other things that you do or suggestions for composing? Lynn and Lynn and, and uh, Kai Delgatti and I have had numerous talks about composition and and uh, <clears throat> have uh, often thought how valuable it would be to have a course on just composition. But the struggle is finding uh, finding lots of written material. Now, I'm going to look at this Edmer, Edgar Whitney uh, book. I appreciate that reference. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you what I I do. Um, a tool that to me is has become super invaluable is my iPhone. And uh, I find that the cropping capacity on my iPhone uh, is my absolutely most vital um, 
compositional tool. So uh, here's when we were in Banff last weekend. Uh, he, these are some photos that I took. Uh, it's similar. It's the same scene, but I took it from different angles. I took it from you know camera down low, camera up high, closer in, uh, further back, and uh, just trying to find the the pictures that would work for me. I'll find that I could take twenty pictures, and there might only be one that really works. And uh, so I'm always always snapping pictures. I think I've got over twenty five thousand pictures in my in my iPhone. So um, these were a couple out of out of about 30 pictures I took, these were three that I pulled out and trying to figure out what I would do with them. So on my phone, I have an app called A Color Story. It's got a lot of tools you can use. But I basically use it for one tool. On my iPhone, <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, take a picture like this and, and I, I never try to zoom in with my camera if I see something that looks like it could be a good painting. I try to get a bigger picture around it because uh, inevitably, if I tried to do that, as I snap the picture, I'll think, oh, darn, I wish I'd seen what was on that left side or whatever. So I take the bigger picture and then I'll, I'll play with my cropping and I'll, I'll pull it down and met, move it around, manipulate it until I find something that maybe appeals to me. Then I'll go over to my color story app and I'll pull that photo from my, from my camera and crop it in the color story and drop it back into my pictures. And now I've got the original picture plus a cropped picture. And that way I haven't lost the original and I can go back in, I could make, I could make a dozen different uh, cropped could, could versions. Could you elaborate on the color story app? Well, it's, it's the one I use to, to crop it. And, and then I, I save the cropped version and then it drops it back into my regular photos. Well, I thought it was to do with color though. It does a whole lot of other things. It does color stuff, it does all kinds of, of things that you know, I just haven't bothered to play with, but but yeah, it's it's quite versatile. But for me, it, it's valuable just so that I don't lose my original photo. If I if I crop the original photo in my iPhone, then I don't have the original anymore. I've just got the cropped version. But this way, I've got the cropped version and the original, so I can continue to use the original for other things. I do something similar, Brian. I just but I just take a second picture of the original photo. Mm -hmm. And then I'll make crops from the, from that one, but yeah, it's probably easier to have an app to do it. So, can you do that on your telephone? Take the second picture. Yep, just in my app. Like I just take a photo of the photo, and then I'll crop it, so that I still keep the original. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that too. I I don't know how to do that. I'll I'll have a look at that. So so then I when I when I um when I'm playing with my iPhone doing the cropping. I'll uh, take a picture like that and I'll say, okay, what do I want to do with that? And in this case, I thought, well, I'm going to chop the trees off the top because, you know, I don't, I'm not, there's nothing all that interesting up there. But then when I had did that, the bottom was too heavy. So I, I thought, well, what if I cropped the top and the bottom? And look at the difference between this and this by cropping the, that little bit of bottom off. It suddenly has, it's, it's nicer, you know, and it's more balanced. And, and if you really start looking at some of those rules we talked about, uh, you know, it really kind of has a sense of some thirds going on, right? Uh, there is some triangular things happening to it, you know? And so intuitively, I kind of decided I really like that scene. But when I look back at the rules, I realized, well, it's it's because some of those things are actually working. Uh, the, the thirds, the three, the triangle, it's all it's all in the little photo there. So, um, so that's how I arrived at that that as a potential painting, right? Mm -hmm. So then I took it <clears throat> and uh, started to do a little bit of sketching. And at this point, the decision, the, the, the conversation with myself was, well, what am I gonna do with this? And, and how do I wanna paint it? Because there's an enormous amount of detail here. Uh, way in the background is the Bant Springs Hotel. If I wanted to emphasize the hotel, then, what I would do with this piece is I would um, sh shadow this side of the rock much more heavily. I'd paint it very loose and I would just pick up some sunlight on the top of that hill. I'd move Bant Springs over so it was more balanced in the picture and I would put a ray of sunshine on it so that it stuck up. So this would be very fuzzy and the detail would happen back up 
in behind. Or if I wanted to emphasize this rock, because I, I, I love painting rock, snow, and water. Those are three things that I just really enjoy painting. So if I wanted to emphasize that, I would do the flip and I would take everything back there and, and paint it very uh, loosely and uh, very non-detailed. And I'd pull on my detail up into here and my contrasting colors, et cetera. So, you know, there's two directions I could take that. And it was helpful to, to play around with the drawing so I could see that a little bit better. What would you do with that if you were gonna paint that? I think I would crop the left part and paint the other, what was left. So bring in more of this? I, could, I would take off about, not too, almost to the tree, but not quite. Come up in here, take this off? Yeah, this, that whole left section, yeah. I would take it out. That would be nice. I would, I would focus on the river and the, yeah. and the rock. Nice. Good suggestion. I like that. Anybody else? What would you do with that? If the building is what your focus is, I like how you've made the trees smaller because in the original photo, I feel like the trees are blocking too mm. much of it. I want to see more of it. Okay. Okay, good. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I can only see the building since you mentioned it. I didn't even yeah. identify it as a building. And that's because the values are too close. Mm -hmm. That's why if I were going to emphasize, I would have to put a ray of sunshine on it so the values were more contrasting. It's interesting how everything is converging in the middle, kind of in the middle. Yeah, you've got some strong visual uh, lines. Mm -hmm. Now really these lines are leading you right up into this little spot here. Yeah. 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 So I think, I think what you did by emphasizing the building, it was necessary to take the eye over to the left rather than getting stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Eh? So, so tell me what you might do with this. Similar piece, similar photograph. If you were going to try to something out of that. Do you see anything that would appeal to you? I would uh, crop it up from the bottom a bit. There's too much snow too much. there. Okay, get rid of some and of that. I would also crop the left in a little. In here? Yeah. Some of that off? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. You just wanna... have the, the trees, the rock, and the river. Trees, the rock, and the river, yeah. Yeah, so you'd get this nice. Yeah, it depends. So kind of claustrophobic. Sorry? I felt when you crop the trees, it makes me feel kind of claustrophobic. Is it? You <laughs> I want to see the whole tree. <laughs> no. Yeah, so you prefer it taller? But, uh, yeah, I'll definitely change your... I, I, I want to see the top of the tree. Like, I feel like it's, ah, you cut it off. It just makes me feel <laughs> claustrophobic. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I like the composition if you would cut it just left of the building. So left that of the building? Cut that off? Yeah, so you cut off the left sort of almost half. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, almost half. You're saying uh, this off? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of nice elements there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. uh, I probably will paint, uh, cut it in half and just use the right side and yeah. uh, focus on the first step. Oops. Oops, sorry. Okay, yeah, focus in here, yeah. Yeah. Focus on, on the first step and, and it have a story there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Really, I will forget about the building. What's that? I, I will remove the building. Yeah. I prefer just the nature, the, the trees, the river. And uh, I would put more sky too. More sky? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. one question. It happens that you paint uh, more than one painting of this the place with the with the photos that you take. 
Yes. Yeah, you could paint. There's there's a dozen paintings you could pull out of this, isn't there? But do you do that, that to paint a, a several paintings about a subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something we haven't considered too, but you know, right there, you could easily drop an animal. An elk. Yes. Yes. A wolf. Or I whatever. even thought there could be a person sitting there. <laughs> a bear. I mean, you know, right there, there's a focal opportunity to create some. Yeah. Right? But so, I also like the the tree trunk in the front that I notice now that is going from left to right down oh. below there. Yeah, that Damn. one. Yeah. Yeah, there's a very strong diagonal there that that's yeah. yeah to play with yeah, yeah, and and other diagonals that you know are happening too. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's some strong things there. Yeah. So this is why I like my iPhone because, and why I like to hang on to my original because, I'll often have a photograph and I think oh, I don't think there's anything there until I start playing around with my cropping and all of a sudden something leaps off the page and I think, my goodness, I didn't even know I had that there. So so this is. This is what I've considered, and I love all your ideas because every one of them it could be a wonderful painting. But here's a direction I kind of thought of. I thought, what if I went and just looked at what's there? I started with that. that I don't don't like that quite. But what if I did this? What if I cropped it tighter on the, both sides? And I came away thinking, I would like to paint that. That would be fun, right? right. But again, oh, and that just out <laughs> pretty large. There's, yeah, yeah, and and you know, um, if I was trying to emphasize the hotel, uh, that's not a bad image to do it with, you know. That's a really nice uh, composition. Yeah, yeah. It, leads, it leads your eye up to the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's a triangle going up to there's it. Tri triangles going up, yeah. There's the thirds, you know. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. And Brian, yeah, you could um. Like if you brought your photo into Word, like use the cropping tool in Word, like copy the photo and then and then crop away in Word as well. If you wanted to be working on a looking at a bigger screen than just your phone, yep, there's a yep. cropping tool in Word. And and I've used that too. But what I like about the well, personally, it's just my my feeling. But what I like about the phone is that I can um, quickly change it. With the word one, you know, it takes a little bit longer to move things around. So I like this because of, of how immediate I can go from one image to another. But yeah, yeah the there's all these kinds of tools that are fabulous. The phone is amazing. Yeah, I love my iPhone. Another uh, one that I just discovered that I just love is if you're doing wildlife and you take a picture of an animal or a bird and their emotion, if you put it on live mm -hmm. and you take the live photo, then yeah. you have like 14 different captures so you can capture it like it's moving. So I didn't realize this, but like maybe you don't get the front of the face and then you put it on live and you can move over the images. Yeah. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that one? It's yeah. very cool, yeah. Yeah, it is really cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so much versatility in our tools now. I do uh, everything on my iPad and I know there is the live button also, but I've never used it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I took art history classes years ago, the professors would often talk about um, these guys who had great visual memory and uh, because they didn't have any, any tools like this. So mm -hmm. they would see a scene and have to, a day or two later, translate it into, onto a canvas. And it was their visual memory that made them such good artists. And we've got the advantage now. We've got, we've got it in our phone. <laughs> anyway, so, so there's just a, a tool that, of many tools that uh, I just find so helpful. It's just that, and that playing around with your photos. It's amazing how often you can find something that you didn't even realize was in there. Mm -hmm. So composing, very significant part of what we need to do, right? So, so from, from my bounce thing, I, I've kind of come up with three images that I probably will paint. I, I didn't show you this one, but uh, I like Ooh, that. Yes. You know, I really like that. Again, it's kind of, you got the thirds going on there. You got three yeah. trees, you know. Uh, you got some diagonal things. I, I like it. I just, that was a good one. And this one, of course, and then that one we looked at. 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, um, I find it so valuable. And often when I, when I'm, and I want to start a new painting, I don't know what to look at, or I don't have an image in mind. I'll go back through my phone and just start cropping. And all of a sudden things pop out and I go, oh, that's a great painting. And, and I bring it home and go at it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we've kind of talked about that. How do you, how do you compose your pieces? Do you have any other thoughts to add to that of how you go about it? Okay. With that in mind, <clears throat> um, hmm. uh, we've done uh, last week. We done under the water. This week we're going to look at painting something on the water, and uh, it it doesn't have to be a fish or a bird or whatever. I mean, there's there's a endless opportunities here so let's have a look and see what we have now okay yeah <laughs> so the big question and i get asked this all the time which is how do i paint water right <laughs> anybody found an answer to that one yet <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> well the answer was, <laughs> go ahead very carefully. <laughs> Let me show you. Um, um, the question that, that um, one of the, the things that I love about painting is this question. Um, um, how am I gonna paint this painting, right? And anytime I, I sit down and look at an image, that's, that's, to me, that's the, the fun of it, just to start off with, how would I paint that? And, and then I have to look at it, study it, think about it. And we've just kind of been walking through that, looking at some of these images. How would I paint that? And, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, what textures would I use? What techniques would I use? Would I use a little bit of this? Would I use a little bit of that? You know, do I crop anything? Do I, do I mask anything? I mean, I love those. I love that little process of thinking that through. So the same thing, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Same thing is true of painting water. And um, what, I, what, what I find that a lot of students uh, kind of say is <laughs> they get involved with painting the scene above the water. Then when they get to the water, they want kind of a quick five minute solution, you know, and I'm done. And uh, don't understand why it's not working because the water is probably gonna take as much thought and painting as did the land above, right? But we don't want to do that. We just wanted to, whoosh, there it is, there's the water. So last May, before we left Ontario, I took my, my kayak and dropped it into a little creek not far from our house. And these pictures were all taken within 20 minutes of each other, all in the same location. Wow. And um, can you see any similarities in how you paint those scenes of water? They're all completely different, right? Reflection. <laughs> yeah, reflections. But again, is there is there a slick answer to how to do it? No, you know they're all different. They're all very very different. Uh, here again, there's reflections of trees, but what's going on here is different than here. And here, there's a little bit of a a wavy movement in the water, and it's created something different. Here, there's there's a nice smooth surface. It's created something different. So um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some observation skill, right? Here we've got a perfectly smooth, and here we've just got this tiny little bit of ripple. Completely different experience painting the two of them. Um, here, I think this is the same scene, same place, um, same bird probably, and yet look at the difference in the water, painting this versus this. So what's the answer to how to paint water? However the, however the reference tells you to paint it. <laughs> exactly. It goes back to what we were doing with last week with the drawing. It, it's looking. You have to look, 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 right? And uh, a lot of us don't want to do that with water because it looks complex and truthfully it is but in the looking <clears throat> like in here uh i see two two essential colors there's some cobalt blue and probably some raw sienna happening through there and and i see 
shapes and patterns. I don't have to draw that exactly what's there, but I certainly need to understand the shapes and the patterns that are going on in the water. So, so like here, there's there's a long line, but it's it's more of a solid line on the top, but on the bottom, it's a soft edge line. There's kind of some of this blue works its way up into it, so it's got the sense of a of a wave rolling forward. Sorry, and then in here, there's you know, there's a certain pattern and a and a look to how those little wave shadows appear. So as I study that, and then I work it into a drawing, then I can throw the paint on and it's gonna be believable, right? But I get over here and I've got the same sorts of things happening, same colors, but now I've got to deal with the surf and the foam on the water. And again, it's study. I have to study it, study it, study it, think about it. And I might be able to paint it in a simplified manner, but it's not gonna be believable if I haven't spent the time to study the patterns and, and the shapes of what's going on out there, right? So that's how we paint water. It takes time, observation. You can, you can get lost in the ripples. You can. And so I wouldn't suggest that anybody try to paint every ripple exactly what's in the, in the photo reference, but to understand the shapes and the forms and how they work together, then you can get your brush out and try to replicate those forms and patterns, then it's going to come out looking like water, right? I found underwater really, really difficult to show that it was like water. Yeah. Is it like the different lights showing through or I, you know. Well, again, that goes back to your photo reference. Study your photo yep. reference and what's yep. going on, you know. In some cases, there might be more light near the top and dark near the bottom. But that's not going to be true in all cases, you know. There, there could be all kinds of other things. So, um, oh, like, oh, some of those um, um, <clears throat> reflective lights, uh, reflective uh, light patterns on the back of the fish. The brain says it's white. If you look carefully, you might discover they're green because the water's green, you know. Yeah. So you really need to study it. You had to put the a little bit of the water over it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So those are those are the the tricks, right? Um, like here again, an ocean surface, you know, if you were to study, that would be relatively easy to paint if you studied those patterns first, you know, like there's kind of a light blue laid in there, then you could come in with some dark blue, but, but study those, those, the patterns of how that, how your brush strokes would move across there. And uh, in that case, in a case like that, I would take my flat brush and I would turn it sideways so I can get a, a sideways um, mark. And that, that brush would be perfect for creating some of those wave patterns for there. I get over to here and there's, this is actually, a, 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 I love the water and all this because you've got a wide variety from here to the foam on, on here to the splash. I think that would be a really fun, fun piece to paint. Um, <clears throat> how do you make something look wet? What's the key to that? Well, how, how would you paint those dolphins so that they looked like they were wet? Leaving the light on them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. White if you... reflection. Say it again? White reflection. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. Like... Little things like like this really important to make something look like it's it's got uh, a wet surface. Those the, that little white white thing there, uh, this line along the side, it's just simply a light reflection, and and the the various um, colors that are involved there. You know, you put all those together, and that's what's going to create a a look of a wet look. So the contrast would be really, really important. Very, yeah, very important. You know, because because you look at the dolphin, you assume that this the value and the color of it, but when you really start to study, this is a very different color and a very mm -hmm. very different value, right? So you, you need to include all of it. It right. seems to me as if you would have to even. Um, um, 
overdo it, uh, for lack of another word, but to make the white even brighter than what it looks like here in the picture. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Em emphasize your your values and colors. Yeah. Yep. So you know. So we're talking about painting things on water. If you really want a challenge, <laughs> there's wow. things like this. <laughs> and this picture has intrigued me. When I've been walking the dog last week, I, a, a few times I found myself just thinking, how would I paint this? How would I do that? And see, there's the question that intrigues me so much. How would I do that? And and I thought a lot about it. And, and I, I'm seriously considering painting this for my own house. But um, I thought, you know, to get this, uh, I'll come back. I'll show I'll show you in a painting I did do, and then I'll come back and tell you how I would tackle that one. But but yeah. But then if you really want to get real intricate, <laughs> look at that for a beautiful, oh, beautiful wow. imagery. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. So I've well, tried to I've tried I to have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh in this previous one, if uh, if you don't there with the bear or even the fish. Mm -hmm. Um I I would tend to use wax crayon, the white wax crayon, because it gives you lots of texture than if you put the color on top. Okay, thanks. That's a good suggestion. I've never tried that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I just wondered what you think of doing it with a crayon instead of the liquid, because the liquid would drive you nuts there. Well, let, let me show you a picture, and I'll come back to this, and I'll show you. Okay. Okay. I think I'm try. This this would be fun to paint. Look at you'd have to study it. Look at all these amazing shapes, mm -hmm. and colors happening through there. But if you took it shape by shape, even though it doesn't make sense each one, by the mm -hmm. time you put them all together, you'd find it would look exactly like that. Beautiful. I'm Beautiful. not understanding what that is like. Is it falling water or like? Well, it's a bird just taking off. And this is the, the water that's lifted up. Yeah. So oh, that's his tail. OK, OK, gotcha. <laughs> it's too bad we don't have the picture with the bird, because that, that would be a great little painting to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, even, even these are fun, you know, these little reflective lines going in there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so. I've tried to give you a wide range of, of comfort level. You know, if you want to do something that's um, that's more simplified, and, and I'll show you a bunch of examples here in a bit, or if you want to get more complex, you're welcome to tackle whatever you want, or whatever, you know, meet your comfort level. So how do we paint water? Again, it's, um, I've got to look, 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 look. So like I said, it's one of my favorite things to paint. Um, in this case, we looked at this picture a couple of weeks ago, yeah. This piece, um, it looks very simple what the artist has done, but that came after the artist has studied the patterns that were happening in the water. And that's why the artist was able to pull that off. And again, here too, there's a, the, the artist has studied the patterns and then with their brush have been able to create the feeling of those patterns. So um, I like painting water. And you know, oh. a wide variety from just a flat uh, sky reflection to where there's rocks underneath. Um, you know, different patterns in the water, whatever. I mean, I just really enjoy that kind of thing. So, is is there anything standard about any of those? Obviously, not there. Oh. And uh, again, here, you know, it's, it's got uh, doesn't look like anything else that, that we're that's, looking at. That's mind blowing. <laughs> What's, and they're fun to do. So, you wow. know, you go from dark, dark, dark to light, 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 you know. Again, yeah. there's there's no standard, oh, that's how to do it, you know. It, there's It's different. Again, there's a similar color scheme, but, but a very different thing happening because of the surf around the boat. Wow. And again, different things like that. So how do you paint water? You have to study it. You have to study it. You have to study it, right? And this, this was fun to study. There was a lot of detail in there to figure out. Wow. And again, you get waterfalls. 
similar sort of thing. You know, you study what you've got there. So, um, well, again, this one was incredibly fun to do. That was really good. <laughs> it was a very challenging one. Wow. Yeah. So um, this is Poppy Balzer, who is on the East Coast. She's, uh, she's one of Canada's top watercolorists and uh, has a worldwide uh, following action. She's really good. And uh, she has spent years sitting on the seashore painting the sea and, uh, and the, the oceans it rolls in. So to her, she's spent enough time with this that she sees the patterns and the forms and the shapes clear enough that she's able to reduce and simplify. You see some of these shapes that she's painted in here? Right. And that has come because she studied it so carefully that it's easy for her to figure out what, what's going on out there, right? And you can see in here, similar sort of things, simple brush strokes, but a lot of study to learn how to create those simple brush strokes. Here's some more of her pieces here. And, and even again, you, um, she sees colors that, that we wouldn't normally think were in the water, you know, everything from these beiges to purples to greens, you know, and our, our, our brain just wants to say blue, and that's, that's not the case. So you need to study the water, study the water, study the water. So one of her cohorts out there is Ron Hazel, who has also spent years on the seashore studying and, and painting. He's probably formalized how to paint water more than most. And uh, he's got it right down to, to a, a quick little science. If you, if you read any of, um, oh golly, what's his name? Gordon McKenzie's books. Gordon McKenzie also has got- I know him. He's very, very, he's good. He's very, very good. Yeah, I've and got three of his books. Yeah, and, he, he, and excellent books, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I learned so much about painting from him. But um, he also formalized and simplified down to a point. But again, before you can really apply those simplified formulas, you have to have spent the time looking. I See? have a question about Ron Hazel. Hmm. His painting there of the water. Hmm. Now, I would never have thought to put those colors in. How does, this yeah. is what I'm, I can't understand is how did he decide that? <laughs> Study. He, he looked at those oceans for so long, he sees the greens, the blues, the purples. And the reds? Yeah. Well, now this is, this is rock sticking up out of the surf. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he spent it's... lots of time studying those. Beautiful. To see it, yeah. 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 And so there's the key. How do I paint water? Look, look, study, study. Sketch, 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 right? And there's how we get there. So this is the piece I did this week. Wow. Um, I'll show you quickly how I composed it and then I'll tell you how I did the painting. It looks complicated, right? Yeah. In truth, it's, it was, if you know the technique, it's very, very simple. So I'll show that to you in just a second here. So here's how I started. <clears throat> I um, played around with my little sketch in, in the photo reference. This waterfall went all the way around. It wrapped around on this side. But I didn't want to do that because I wanted to, to emphasize more the bear. So I thought I would get rid of that whole thing over here and just leave it white. So then I started thinking, you know, where am I going to put the edge of the waterfall? And I pulled it back here from, from what it was in the reference. And I, I decided I needed to go dark, dark out there. So then I played around with the colors a bit and I kind of kept it to, there really are three things going on. There's, there's the water, there's the bear, there's the fish. Right, so I played around with that a little bit. Um, I did my initial drawing <clears throat> and decided that that it, it didn't have the drama that the moment should have had. So I um, and and this wasn't quite big enough to fit on on in my watercolor frame. By the time I drew it, I wanted it a little bit bigger, bare. So I photocopied it and photocopied it a little larger on on my copy machine. And then I took this and started twisting it. Instead of having it line up, you know, up and down, north and south sort of thing, I, I bent the bear so there was more of an angle of him reaching down into the water. 
So, so this, this was a little bit more passive. This is a little bit more, he's really stretching to try to get in there, right? And to try to capture that fish. So <clears throat> I also extended the neck a little bit from, from the original photo with the idea and the, and the nose. <clears throat> so he's really reaching out to try to capture his fish. And then I went ahead and did the painting. So <clears throat> as complicated as it looks, it's really quite simple. Uh, <clears throat> and you'll get the video that so you can see how I did it. Got my toothbrush and my masking fluid splattered. A bunch of places where I knew that there would be splattered. Not, less up here because obviously the water above the, the uh, waterfall is not going to be as, as foamy. <clears throat> then I took my lightest colors and I, I did dry brush. Do you know, <clears throat> do you guys want, want to explain dry brush? What is that? Very uh, little water. Painting, painting on with no water on the paper. Um, uh, that's sort of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of what it is. When you drag your brush with limited paint on it, so it leaves some of the paper white. Yeah, so instead of painting on your point of your brush, you're going to actually drag your brush on its side. Yeah. yeah. And you're going to let the the um, fabric of the paper is going to at the tops of those of the bumps of the paper is going to pick up the paint as you go along. So a good way to dry brush is you load your brush up. And then with a sponge, you just do that. And you take out, you know, it's going to take probably half the paint out of that. And it's going to get your brush loaded just about exactly how you want it to do a good dry brush. And then you use it on the side, you lightly go along the top. And so that's, that's how I, I did some of these initial uh, marks in here. So I did a very light, basically that's just almost just the dirt in the bottom of your palette. And uh, as, it, as it came back up, I, I added a little bit more color and then I dried it and then I splattered a second time because not all foam is white, you know? And so you'll see in some of these foam spots, some of them are blue, some are green. And um, if it was just all white, it would frankly just, it wouldn't look as realistic. So then, <clears throat> then after I had that, then I started dry brushing again, some of these lines coming down and uh, added some darker colors as it got up near the top. And then uh, made sure that where the water was coming up against the bear, there was lots of foam splashing up behind him. And then painted in the darks and that was it. Then I, I made sure that the splatter didn't cover, you know, I pulled any splatter that had gone onto the bear off there so that he didn't, he didn't, wasn't all splattered and uh, painted the bear. And actually the, the bear was nice to paint because most of that's just done wet and wet. Adding, it might have done like three different layers, but each time I just was wet, I was dropping color in and letting it kind of do its own thing. Make sure the values are what they should be. So it's, it's, it's not a difficult painting to do actually. It's, it's quite um, simple, but at the same time, it's got some effect. Now, any thoughts, questions? Did you tape off the bear and the fish? No, <clears throat> no, no, I just uh, painted them. I love the simplicity of it. Like you've put what's important and that's what I need to do is get rid of the, <laughs> the extra junk. I just love it. <laughs> and that's hard to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, to just like to practice that kind of water without the bear even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, if you, if you practice that a couple of times, you'd find that uh, you'd be quite pleased with how well it works. It, the splatter and the, and the dry brush. Except that I, I would have to cover my floor in order to use the, the, the toothbrush to splatter the liquid um, resist. That's just unbelievable. I don't know oh. where my place I can do that. <laughs> I'll show you. In the bathroom. I'll show you a couple of things. One, um, you know, in at Walmart, you can buy those, um, oh, they're either cardboard or that foam board fold outs, you know, they're about three feet high and they, they fold out. Uh, I've bought a couple of those and I'll put those around my painting when I go to splatter. I see. Otherwise I get paint and, and uh, frisk it all over the house. The other right. thing, the other way to do it is um, 
no, um, Paul Talbot Greaves in the class I'm taking was showing how to do this. You'll take a brush like this, and, and it's not sable. Or, I'm mean, sorry, it's not synthetic. You make sure it's, it's the sable. That's that's right. Right. Yeah. And he'll load his brush up, and then to, um, to uh, splatter, he's got it so that rather than it, rather than, you know, kind of shotguns everywhere, he'll take it and he holds his brush down like this, and he'll, he'll bring it down in a, in a motion like this, and when he gets to the bottom, he just flicks it. And he said, by doing that, he can actually control where the, the splatter pattern happens. And ah. uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't spread out far and wide. And so he, okay. can, he can actually, you know, um, yeah. have it where he wants to go. I've I done know that with the, the, the gouache, but I, I never even dreamed of doing that with a liquid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if the, if, if the uh, that splatter pattern would work with with frisket as well because it's so thick, but with paint that's how he that's how he. Uh, right. Holy smoke! Yes, my <laughs> wife was thrilled when she discovered that I learned how to control my splatters. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, I'm always having to wipe splatters off of walls and furniture and everywhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so so. This week, again, um, paint something on water. Uh, here's a whole series of potential things you might want to consider. Some of them are, are fairly easy. Again, uh, you know, if you're going to paint that again, you know, watch your values. There's some real strong blacks and whites going on through there. And uh, in here, some real soft initial layers, and then a couple of more layers above. Uh, to, to do something like that. Um, <clears throat> these are a similar bird, but again, some fun things happening with the with the water. Mm -hmm. I, even the colors are fun, you know, I can hear you can see you've got this nice soft cobalt blues, washed out cobalt blues. In fact, yeah. it's almost the cobalt blue mixed with some white to really get that color. And then you've got some greens, then you've got some purples even in the water. Beautiful. And again, even here, there's some there's some uh, greens and some blues with purples mixing in, right? And right here, very very simple, but um, the real key is what's happening in these patterns of the uh, the wake behind the bird. Again, those would all be fun. Uh, there's some swans if you're interested in swan pictures. Yep. Um, if you were going to tackle this, I, I wouldn't have the divided um, colors there in behind like they've got, because no one will know what it is. And we don't even know what it is. If you don't know what it is in the photograph, no one will ever figure out what it is in the painting. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're going to do something like this, Steve, either go solid one color through or the other yeah. color through, a warm color, cool color, whatever. But, um, <clears throat> again, those are some kind of interesting pictures. This is really pretty. Mm -hmm. How would you do this? How would you get that, those turquoise? <laughs> What's that? Use the splatter there. <laughs> yeah, and probably color your splatter, right? Get some get some strong white, mix in some it, your teal color and splatter it on top of your, of your brown. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't say brown, it's more of a, Sienna. Yeah, that's a gorgeous photo. Mm -hmm. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So my brother uh, sat one day with his camera watching a bunch of swans coming in and, in and out of a pond. And he said, <laughs> he said, the fascinating thing about swans is they're so majestic and they're so dignified and they're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you'll see them come floating down and, and it's just, you know, just magnificent. But he said, the one, the one weakness these swans have is that they can't land. And he said, as soon as they get near the water, it's just, it's like they fall to pieces and they stumble and they fall all over each other and they crash into other swans. And she, he said, there's just no control when they put their feet down into the water. It's just quite funny. <laughs> so you might want to tackle something, you know, it doesn't have to be birds. You might want to tackle some fish. 
again, those would be kind of fun. Uh, you know, some of these <clears throat> some of these foam things are very really, really fun. And if you really want to get crazy, you know, tackle something like that. So um, I showed you what I did with with my bear. So as I walked around thinking, what would I do with something like this? What I would try is um, I would do a little bit of splatter, white splatter to start. And then uh, those of you who've been in Michael Solovyov's classes know that he does this little thing where he takes the brush by the end. He, what's it called? Flicka, uh, what's he call that, do you know? Where he, he's kind of, wiggles the brush around like this and he, he flicks the paint on with a, with a real sharp point. And I thought I would do that with masking fluid. And I'd flick some of these little shapes in here and uh, just a few that were white. Then I'd put a color on it. So a soft bluish green. Then I'd do it again. And I'd do another color and I'd probably do it a third time just to create some of these patterns that are in the water. Anyway, that's that's what I was thinking. I do a lot of dry brush also through that area. Um, and then you may want something, you know, something like that. This is this is fun. This would be a fun painting to do. Wow. We got these nice washes in there. And if you want to be real dramatic, hang that in your grandkids bedroom. <laughs> see see how well they sleep at night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, so there's some options, and again, I've tried to I've tried to give you a wide range of uh, of comfort level, so you can tackle something really difficult or something much more simple. Unbelievable. That's all right. <laughs> all right, let's go look at some of your paintings from last week. Um, so yeah, let's walk through some of these. So Annie. You chose this really cool looking turtle. And here's your your final piece. Beautiful. Wow. Any comments, Annie? Uh, not turn out well, well. I find it's difficult to paint under the sea. Mm -hmm. If you want to put color in it, it's easy to turn out like a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is hard to catch that under the sea field, isn't it? Yeah. Holy smoke. But that's pretty. Unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. It's Gorgeous. beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. But I practiced my native painting with the rock and stuff. I suck at it. Like the, the negative painting, I still struggle with it. Oh, I thought you did really well there. Yes. I like it, Annie. And you use the, the liquid resist for, for the pattern on the wing? Yes, yes. Holy smoke. Water. Yeah, beautiful. Wow. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice, Annie. I really like it. Those of you who don't know Annie's work, she's, she's really, really good with color. She loves good, strong color, and that's really nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful, Annie. Love it. Yeah, love it. Beverly, this is really fun. Tell us about your piece here. Wow. Well, um, I tried it about three times before I finally settled on something. Hmm. Um, the water again was, it's a challenge. And even the colors on the uh, dolphin. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the blue, the dark blue in the photo up at the left top, so I left it out. And I think I like it better like this. Okay. Um, other than that, I, I found it useful to do the sketch first, too. The uh, pencil sketch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very you did a really, good job. really good job on your pencil sketch and your drawing here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you did you know, a lot. I can see a lot of things I would correct now that it's posted, <laughs> yeah. but I can I can still see things uh, yeah. up in the nose, down in the water area where where it's going into the water, uh, around the eye, up by the jaw, the 
under the mouth. Mm -hmm. There's a number of places where I could work, do some work on. Yeah, but you did a nice job of it though. <clears throat> That's really nice. Thanks. That's a difficult blue to, to capture, isn't it? That's a challenge. Uh, yeah, it's probably a, com a combination of cobalt and a couple of others in the dirty part of the pan <laughs> with with the burnt sienna to gray it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks. Nice. So um, I'll just, can I just share a thought here? Sure. Um, um, so if you see here, there are some shapes that are color shapes. Yes. Um, don't be afraid to, to draw those in as though they were a distinct item. And uh, then when you paint it, it's, you know, um, uh, it, you can almost paint by number it. You know what I mean? This one's blue, this one's gray, this one's, you know. And, uh, and uh, let the colors run together, but you'll find that uh, the, oh. the, yeah, that's that's a, can often be an effective way to do it. I'm always worried about leaving hard edges. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe I uh, paint some of it out, I don't know. Um, um, okay, everybody, what do you do if, if you have a hard edge you want to soften up? How do you do that? Just use water. water. Just, just water? Clear water? Wet, wet the area and blend it out. Yeah, blend it out. Let me take you all the way back to the beginning of here. I'm going to show you something. This is a, a technique that uh, Paul... Talbot Greaves uses, which is very, very effective. All right, let's continue right back to the beginning here. Okay, there it was. So, <clears throat> um, when Paul Talbot Greaves paints, he, he leaves the impression that he's one of those guys who paints very wet, when in reality he doesn't. He paints actually quite dry. And uh, and, but he creates the illusion that he's painted wet. So like back up along the, that mountain edge where you can see where it's so... Um, 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 Misty if, looking. Yeah, what he's done is he, he has taken his little squirt bottle and he's squirted in that whole area around it after it's dry. And then he'll take a, one of his um, very stiff bristled brushes like like a, a, an oil brush or a or an acrylic brush? A fan and a, brush? And a which? A fan brush? Uh, no, stiff, stiff bristle. And then yeah. um, he'll, he'll, he'll just go in there and start uh, softening that edge. And it'll come up looking very much like it was a wet on wet application. Mm. And uh, it's a very effective way to do it. Because not everybody's comfortable doing wet on wet, but, but the look is gorgeous. So there's a way to do mm. that without having to actually paint into the wet. Mm. So that's one way to deal with, with uh, hard edges. And again, clear water, sometimes even with my soft brushes, I can go in and just start to work that edge and, and uh, soften it up sufficiently. Oh, almost back. That's a lot of slides. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but nice. Your drawing is outstanding. That's really, really well done. Mm -hmm. As, you know, as simple as that seems, it's actually a tough, a tough drawing to do because, because um, the accuracy of those kinds of lines matters when it's such a simple, uh, simple uh, image. You know, and if, if that line were out, it would it would show that it's out. But you you nailed it perfectly. Mm. Yeah. But you can you can see on the sketch that it's out a bit. Yeah, a little tiny bit, yeah, yeah. But you got it. You got it. it worked great. What what do you think of the water? Oh did I <clears throat> yes, your water looks good. Again, you know, if if you can study those shapes and don't be afraid to let some of the darks get a little darker. You see that gets pretty strong. Uh, I better. noticed that, yeah. Yeah. That's one of the places I thought I should work on. Yeah. Um 
cerulean blue and cobalt blue are good uh, bases to use in water. Mm -hmm. And and mixing some white into them too helps uh, create some nice. I have to get white. I don't have white. Yeah. Uh, ultramarine blue is is I wouldn't use it as your base color in in most water scenes. Uh, now th that's that's probably a mistake for me to make such a generalized statement, but um, but I wouldn't make that your first go to color. Um, is it because it's green. Probably better. No, because it's it's really not the right color. Oh. You no, know, it's just, um, but the other colors are, are gonna get closer to what you want. Cerulean mm. and cobalt. Yeah, and there'll be places where, where the ultramarine would be useful, but but if you're really looking here, you know, there's not a lot of ultramarine. It is it is much more of those other softer colors. Anyway, nice job, Beverly. Okay, thank you. Nice. Either, this is fun. Tell us about your piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I, I, if, even when I took the picture, it was wet. I did it at the last minute because it was a very busy week. Uh, I just had the time to do the my drawings. Uh -huh. And after I, I, um, I apply, okay, what I, I put water out at the back of the, of the, Piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I put it on the pl uh, plexiglass, and after I wet the the background, I apply my colors, mm -hmm. and I sometimes I put drops of water, sometimes I put salt, salt, and uh, when I I did some, I I put some. Uh, some colors going to darker, 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 mm -hmm. and at the end, I, I just uh, took my a brush like that. This one that I used for the background, I was uh, humid, and I put it just at the and the the fishes that I are and in the size to put it back. Okay. Okay. That's, okay. That's, it's sorry, my English. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. I love the drawing is outstanding of that little fish. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's really good. Nicely done. Thank Any you. comments? Thank Did you. you use the plexiglass uh, to keep the paper moist? It's what I use for. Uh, this one I always used to put my my paper on. Plexiglass. Plexiglass, yeah. Yeah, and you what wet the back of the paper first. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because I don't have the passions to to do the in, in the right way. No, oh, I, that's the right way. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not wrong. I I'm. I just wanted to confirm that that was the reason you do that. Yeah, it works very well for me. And yeah. uh, uh, when I when I have to 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 dry, I just take it off. I put it on the floor. <laughs> this, I, I I I have a, a, a I did a, a big burnout twenty years ago, so it have to be easy. I yeah. work. Yeah, I I don't have the. The, the 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 I'm not strong enough to do every step. I I paint. What it it goes is that okay? Is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's yeah. I know it's one way to keep the paper moist longer. Yeah. What is this with the plexiglass? Yeah, I've never heard that. Oh, it's a, I can show you. It's a, it's what a, what it's does it like, do? It's like glass, but plastic. Yeah. Yeah, I know what it is, but how, how does it work on this? If oh, you I use the plastic glass, it's keep the paper moist longer and you don't need to stretch the paper as much mm -hmm. because the, the plastic glass almost like a suction, sucking the paper. So yeah. it stays fresh most of the time. You don't need to stretch that much, much. Yeah. 
that's what oh. I'm using too. Yeah, but you wet both sides. on the part. Yeah, yeah, I wet both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a different way to paint because because your paper is wet, and so your paint reacts a little differently. It's it's a wonderful technique, but it but just recognize if you try it, it, it you're you're going to find it um, oh just different. You just have to learn how to, how to deal deal with it because it's different than painted on dry. I use that when I will do wet on wet. Yes. Yep. If it's not, I just use it like a, a base. I don't yep. wet the, the background, the back of the paper. Yeah. So you can't do any kind of masking or taping? Uh, no. No, because well, it'll, uh, it'll uh, what happens if you mask the, on the one side, the moisture underneath is going to uh, stay there. And it's, you would have to wait like a couple of days for, for it to really be dry before you could take that masking off. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's going to tear the paper because it's still moist underneath. So you could technically get away with it, but recognize that you're going to have to do that. Right? I love all your colors in, in that fish face. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I use I a lot it. of stalos. I really like that stalos for the... For, uh, for water. Yeah. Tell us what reds you used in here. I don't know. I have a lot of palettes, so, so I don't have any idea. Okay. It was there. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's true. I have, I can show you. That is one of my palettes. One I, I prepared it like uh, 10 years ago, so I don't remember. Okay. Wow. I know that these ones are more opaque than the, the, the last, these ones. It's the only difference that I have, but I don't remember. This one is uh, Mr. Graham. I really love Mr. Graham watercolors. Yeah. yeah, awesome. I have okay. other ones, but this one is the, the what I use the most. Yeah, well, that, that red's so vibrant, it's beautiful. Thank you. You've created, you've really created a focal point. There's no question where our eye goes, you know? Yeah. Nice that I tried to do. Yeah, it worked. Worked really well. Thank you. Thanks, Ida. Thank you. Thanks, Ida. So, Gabrielle, you, you said you went back and finished this a little bit from last yeah. week. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you added more color in some of the. Some yeah. Of the I took out what was there and uh, put more purple in it and uh, softened the edges and lightened the orange. <laughs> and it, uh, it, it with little things, but it made a big difference. I was Good. much happier with it. Good, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So here's your fish for this week. <laughs> yeah. Your drawings are great. Those are really, really well done. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful drawings. And this looks like you used, what kind of technique did you use to get that water? <laughs> uh, I used tissue paper. Really? Yep, I glue tissue paper onto mylar. And I have a piece here that I cut off that I can show. And I, I like using tissue paper for texture quite a bit. Um, so because I glue it onto mylar, um, it, uh, yes, you can manipulate how you, the, the direction of the tissue paper. And if you take it horizontal, it automatically gives you the sense of water. And if you take it vertical, um, it gives you, or it, it just sort of uh, leads you to think of it as trees. And I put the, the watercolor uh, right onto the tissue paper. And I have worked on both sides in lots of times. In this case, I actually did the drawing on, on the tissue paper side. And I intended to do uh, the reverse just to see how different it will be. And if I have enough time this week, I will do that. Um, so then 
if I do the reverse, I put all the color on the tissue paper and then do the subject on the other side. Mm, cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> any thoughts, any questions? You, you glued the tissue paper down, did you? And or, yes. Yeah. yeah. At first, I thought you just ap applied it and took it off in um, like saran wrap. But yeah. oh, no, I glue it, glue it onto the, the mylar, but I've also used it many times and gluing it right onto the watercolor paper. Cool. Just with the watercolor paper, then you can't work on the backside. Whereas with the mylar, you can work on both sides. Um, what kind of glue do you use? It's um, it's the greatest <laughs> greatest stuff. It's just um, what's it called? Um, um, I have to go and get it to tell you what it's called. It it's just. Um, Sorry. What's the mylar? It's, uh, let's give her, get, let her answer that one. Um, oh, I picked up the wrong one. Um, the mylar is a, a plastic kind of, um, material that the architects used to use for reproducing and for drawing on. And it's now become quite popular again, just to use it in, in artwork, but mm. it's plastic. So it behaves the same way as the UPO. Mm. Mm. I find UPO challenging. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Oops, the glue I use is just matte gel. Hmm. And it's it's the best glue anytime for anything. So when you lay that tissue paper on, do you, do you put it up completely flat or do you, do you crinkle it? No, no, you crinkle it. Hmm. Cool. And you, um, so I, I do uh, water the, the matte down, the gel. Um, because you don't have to use it very thick. You can make it very, uh, um, yeah, thin and just make sure that it it's covers the paper or the mylar really well because of course it dries fast and doing the edges that they, by the time you get finished, the edges would be dry. Okay, okay. Well, that's cool. I've never heard of that kind of thing before. Yeah. Yeah, fun. Well, thank you for sharing that. I don't know if it's my own invention, but I, I love adding texture to the watercolor. And most people have a hard time believing that it's, it's just watercolor that I use. And now I've started using the inks. Of course, it's a whole other. When, you're all, when it's all said and done, do you take the tissue paper off or you leave it oh, on? Oh, no, 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 it stays on. Okay. Hmm, and cool. what color is your tissue paper? Is it white and you paint it or? It's white. It's white. And um, it's just the kind of okay. tissue paper that you get when you buy something and they wrap it up in the store. Wrap. So it's, uh, I've tried to buy a roll of it in the art shop and the tissue paper in the art shop is too, too uh, solid and you can't get it as soft as it needs to be. Do you apply the paint before you apply the matte gel? Because how no, does, no, oh, the, so the matte it, gel it, actually. It, yeah, oh. in fact, uh, if, you, if I'm not taking too much time, um, show you another one, but uh, like that. I don't know if you can see. Just a little bit. Yeah, move it over. To the, okay, yeah. There it is. So this is done with tissue paper. 
on mylar, and then I glued the whole thing onto a board. Mm. Cool. And, and uh, so in other words, I did the work on the back of the mylar. So the tissue paper and the colors and the watercolor and all of this. Um, and then I glued the side that I worked on onto the board. So in other words, you don't need to put it behind glass. It's not going to fade. You don't have to protect it because now the, the front is, is the protection. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. So is Mylar clear then? Yes, you can buy it that it is very clear and you can buy it. Uh -huh. It looks sort of like... Um, um, it, it's it's see-through. It's like wax paper, except it's plastic. Mm. Cool. Plastic. Oh, so so Marianne, painting on that, there's no absorbency. Uh, so so the paint reacts differently than it would on on watercolor paper. Uh, yes, it does act a little different, and you don't want to soak it uh, the way you would on paper. But I, you know, you go over it a few times and you darken it. And so, for instance, the right, the left side of the fish, I needed to get a lot darker. So I had to do several, several coats. Mm -hmm. But you try not to soak it too much. It's just the color. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks very much, Gabrielle. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, George has COVID, so he's not here today. Uh, he's in, in bed, and so we can say hi to him because I'm recording this. We'll send it to him. <laughs> but he, here were his drawings, which were very well done. Wow, yes. And his, his final painting. Just about George isn't here to tell us a little bit about his technique back there. Nice style. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad we can't get his feedback on that, but yeah, nice. Nice. He even, wow. What's that? He even has that, that the fish underneath. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he worked that guy in too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here was uh, Julie's, and again, Julie's on the road. We'll send her this video, but very pretty. What, her colors and everything, very nice. And I like the way she's, been uh, more suggestive than than uh, detailed. Very nice. Very cool. And this is Louise's. She was she attended class yesterday because she was not available today. But a couple of beluga whales, and um, you know we talked about the underwater thing, and you can see from her reference she's followed that. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. that's a that's a real nice feel for the underwater uh, sense of things. Marianne, this is really cool. Tell us about this. Um, <laughs> always takes me a lot longer than I think. So that's why you get them late, Brian. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, I was trying to do like in the photo, the above the fish, the that little area of, of uh, lighter water. Uh -huh. And it was just so I just decided to just kind of blur it all, all and and then um, down below I had I didn't want to do all the fish in there and so I thought oh, I'll just kind of put in these dark shadows and then it was like too dark so then I was lifting it up anyway because I wanted to add the light underneath the main fish there like the streaks of light and so looking back it's like yeah I probably should have tried to do some of the fish underneath just so I could put those lights through it because I think that's really a nice feature of the mm -hmm. of the photo but yeah it, yeah and, and as far as like the light on on the fish like on the the main fish yeah mine are they're too too white and the one below too so those lights I guess should be maybe a little yellow in them um and I had a hard time doing that tree it didn't look <laughs> all these things like that doesn't look hard and then I start doing it anyway so um <laughs> it's, uh, it's good exercise yeah and I can see yeah there's probably should be more yellow in the in the tree and 
it's it's a whole different thing when you know I paint it and then I take a picture and I put it up and it's like what it looks completely different so I keep telling myself I need to take photos while I'm painting it and put it up because yeah it gives me a whole different perspective of uh, what's actually going on so but yeah you know what I, I love your good exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. colors oh, and everything you. are great your background mm -hmm. is really really nice I like it thanks yeah yeah that's a nice picture yeah. <laughs> it it's it's really nice. Go ahead. It's really nice. I like I like that fish. It's mm -hmm. uh, you've got the colors. Yeah. Thanks. Your values are all really good. Your brine's good. Yeah. So would you say so like on the main fish for the the light marks that are pretty wet on the the bottom part of the fish, I kind of went over the the light marks with with the red, so they're not so white. Should they be maybe a little more yellow, like? Yeah, you could easily uh, put a wash over top of that. Yeah, uh, drop okay. some yellows and, and down here some reds. You know that sort of thing. That yeah, I did some red below, but yeah, it's not quite enough. Yeah, some greens in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could easily drop another wash over it. Okay, and then on the tree, like I kept going, it was too light, then it was too dark, too light, too dark. Um, and now looking at it with the photo, it's like, what is that kind of yellowy green? Maybe it should be more. Uh, you know what, though, it works by itself. Okay. I, 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 well, and what color wash would you use? In here. Like we for over on the fish. I'd use a a, a multicolored wash where I would. Drop some yellow because you've got some like Marianne saying there's some yellow in there, but then up here it's it's even some light purples, and uh, down here it's some red. So I would, yeah, I would get it wet and drop some yellows in some places, purples in others, and reds in other places. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, this line here, you can easily let that dark background uh, work its way right up into that edge. That edge kind of disappears, and it it, it would uh, it would okay. make it rounder, you know, and uh, fit into the. You can see that that edge really is, is undefined because of the dark in behind. So you could correct. Right. Yep. Yeah. But I love the colors you've thrown in the background. That's gorgeous. Thanks. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, nice job. Any other thoughts? I love that yeah, color. Okay, it's very nice. Thanks. So, so for suggestion, so be beneath the main fish, like I know you probably would have drawn every single fish, and <laughs> but I wanted to simplify it. Um, but yeah, I, I lose all the light. Like, so a suggestion for. Uh, you can easily Other just than... instead of fish, uh, do some rocks under it, and the okay. rocks would be lighter on the top and and darker on the on the shaded bottoms. You know, where the okay. edges. And down. then I could still put the the light in them. Yeah. The, yeah. the light yeah. lines. Yeah, because that's definitely them. missing in it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'd be easy to do. Yeah. Because you can, you okay. know, you can afford to get a little darker down there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Thanks. Good job, Marianne. Susan, <clears throat> this is a fun little piece. Yeah, I tried to be a little more fun. Um, I didn't have a lot. I didn't do a sketch. <laughs> I was helping my daughter take care of her new puppy. I didn't have much time to do very much, like you know to stop him from biting me and all these <laughs> anyway so I, I I did one and the proportions were a little better but I done the bat like I completely covered the background with water and I didn't really like it and then my daughter said well what about some white space you know so I redid it and the proportions are a little different yeah I love your colors I love no, your, thank you. 
I tried to put some purples in and uh, different. I I did look at the I did look at the painting because there there were some areas maybe the right could have been a little darker, more purple because it's a little more shadowy on the right. But. Mm -hmm. but it is a nice little piece. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I it, tried to be really loose with my pen too, like I was kind of scribbling. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it has a real nice feel to it. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Nice, nice. Thank you. Tanya, you did two pieces here. You did this bird and and another piece right after. Any comments? Yeah. I wanted to try doing the Regent Bowerbird uh, that I had not done last week. But I have to learn less is more. <laughs> I love color and I get carried away with it. <laughs> <laughs> you are you referring to the reeds? Yes, like I, I was going to ask you, like I, I have tried dulling it by putting some washes, but it, I, should I just put a wash on the whole thing or just wondered if you had some suggestions? Um, you could try that. You could try that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's overly distractive, you know, but yeah, you could try that and see, see what you like. I like your I like the way you've done your uh, soft edges mm -hmm. through the water. That looks really nice. Mm -hmm. I, I found it. Sorry, because your bird is such a contrast in front of it. Um, I love your reeds. Yeah, I think it's great background. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't change that color. <laughs> I'm envious you. <laughs> You do color really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of your style. All those colors is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is nice, Tanya. I like you know in water. This is really effective the way you've you've yeah. taken time to really look, and uh, it shows. In in even though it's very loose, wet. You've you've looked and seen the patterns and the shapes, and it looks nice. It's really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, well done, well done. And your other piece was the koi fish. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. With the <laughs> composition, I was trying to. I really this little guy in the middle. Um, I had taken a picture of him, and I wanted to put him into the. I was trying to use that law of thirds to put the yeah. fish in. Yeah. Um, the, the, this bothers me that like, see how the top, the, the reeds, like it goes in two levels. I wish I had just done that one level. It's kind of weird. So oh. even though the photo does that, I, I think I would leave that out next time. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I love I love this. Again, your reflection in the water is beautiful. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> nice. I, I struggle. I don't do a lot of masking and I really struggle with it. I find my work gets overworked when I use it. And I just found uh, the challenge of not making them look like they're on top of the water. Like I, I almost kind of want to put a wash over it or something to would that help or uh yes. Yeah, I would. And uh, if you if you look, you know you can see because he's underwater. Those are somewhat soft edges around the around him. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you, you could put a put a wash over it, and then with your brush, kind of soften some of those edges a bit, and and he would set down into the water better. Now, when you say soften the edges, um, just take you... your you know run a wash over it. <clears throat> right. Take your brush. And just go along those edges and just kind of lightly uh, blur those edges so that uh, again you can see in here I mean that, that's that is somewhat of a, a blurred edge versus a really sharp edge you know would you use a soft brush or a hard one like that other fellow you were mentioning uh, I would use a soft brush because I, I'm not trying to get rid of color and such okay I want the color to stay there so I'm going to try to just go along that edge and just just um it, you'll find it, it'll just, it'll soften up. 
And in terms of a wash, would you suggest a, um, like I was thinking a really, really light phthalo, like a transparent wash, would something like that work? Or Yeah, a light bluish, yeah, mm -hmm. bluish color, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll try that, thank you. Yeah, yeah um, <clears throat> um, again, as, as you observe, you can see, because they're underwater, most of these edges along that fish are softer edges. So yeah, if you soften those up, it does pull them back down into the water. Whereas yeah. you know, sharp yeah, edges, sharp way. edges are up here on the surface. But. Right, okay, I'll try, I see too. That I thought I was putting lots of reflection under the fish, but not nearly yeah. enough. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I like it. You do that water reflection well, that's really nice. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I like the color of the, the leaves too. Mm -hmm. Water. The... I was glad I left the white on the top too. I think it balances it. Yeah. Better than I had tried filling it all in. I was going to put blue up there and then I thought, no, I think I'll just leave it white. Yeah. I wanted to ask your opinion of that. But... Yeah, nice. Yeah, very nice. Well, yeah. everybody. Oh, did well this week. Sorry, go ahead. It's, it's always challenging trying to, I find changing the composition, adding something in too. That is a challenge, yeah. Yeah. Because you, you don't have the photo reference to see how mm -hmm. it is, and you have to kind of assume some things. Yeah. Is there an app that does that, like on the phone or on an iPad? That uh, I'm not familiar with one. Is anybody familiar with that? I used it on the iPad with Procreate. Procreate. So what what I do I I use how I did my fishes where I I I took the fishes that I wanted I removed the background and I played in the size of paper that I I needed when I when it worked for me in I. I did my drawing with Procreate 2, and after that, I transferred in the watercolor paper. But that I, I like the Procreate because you, you can play with everything, try different things, and after, you're ready. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't, I've heard of that program, I haven't used it. Okay, everybody, so, you did super well this week. So um, this this coming week, we get to paint something on the water, uh, whether it's uh, animal or fish or bird, you know, your, your choice. And um, we'll see how you do. I will send you the copy of this um, recording of the class, as well as, um, might as well stop that.